As dreamers, one of the most difficult disciplines to build in our lives is rest. In the face of countless deadlines, exhaustive to-do lists, and all of the things that we want to accomplish in this world, it seems impossible to develop a lifestyle where we would fill up and be rested. I love this interview with Dr. Julie Caton because we are unpacking what rest looks like for us, not just as a band-aid on an exhausted soul, but how do we develop a lifestyle where we would fill ourselves up continually. This is an interview you don't want to miss, so let's roll that intro and get right into it. and your host for Beyond Written, and I'm so excited. Obviously, we have a number of guests going on here. Um, the most important, of course, is Dr. Julie Caton sitting next to me, sitting next to me right now, and of course, these are our animals. Guys, it's been a long day filming. I'm actually um, Dr. Julie's media assistant, if you wanna say. This is one of my clients, so we've been filming all day for her new book. And so we've honestly just needed a little bit of therapy um, with the animals. So <laughs> we're gonna put them down a little bit. But this is Myla. And that's Golly. Yeah, it's fun. It's a, okay, it's a day for the down. dogs. Yeah, sure, sure. Oh, now that I'm like covered in pug fur. Okay. Um, but in all seriousness, this is a dear friend of mine. This is Dr. Julie Caton, and we've known each other for roughly. Seven years? Seven Eight. years. Yeah. yeah. And we actually started off, um, she called me out of the blue one day. I was cleaning houses, and I had just prayed. I don't know if you knew this. Yeah. I, I prayed, and I asked the Lord. I said, I can't clean houses anymore. I can't do this. I'm so done. And I said, I just need to get a part-time job. I'm in seminary. I just need to find something that's easy and flexible. And she called me not even an hour later. And so that she had gotten my name because I love I love Twitter and social media. <laughs> so so she hired me that Saturday to be her publicist and it's been a wild ride. Right. Yeah. That was the first book that I had that got published. Yes, so that was White Heart. Yeah. So she actually has three books. So the great thing is that Julie is multi passionate and multi skilled in many areas of expertise. Yeah, I'm going to talk to you up a little bit. I've never heard that uh, word, multi passionate. <laughs> multi passionate. So she is not only um, a counselor, she has her own practice out of her home. Um, and she's doing, been doing that for over 40 years, which is amazing. And she's an incredible counselor. Uh, she is a speaker. So she has three books. So she has White Heart, Heart of Deception, and most recently, Soul Pain Revealed, which is right behind us. And so I'm really excited because um, Julie's going to talk a little bit about her journey in writing Soul Pain Revealed and what that's looked like to get to this point. Um, because she's been practicing in her counseling for a long time, and it's almost like the Lord has used your spirituality, your faith, to come alongside that experience to merge into this incredible project. And then we're actually going to talk today about the importance of rest in our mental health. And I thought there was no better person who models this in her life um, than Dr. Julie. So I want to give her an opportunity, kind of give her the mic to tell her story. Wow. Well, thank you, Laura. <laughs> yes, it was a lot. Um, and we are a little slap happy because we've been sitting under the oh, lights all afternoon. Um, and my story, gosh, I think you said to me, I think you wanted me to talk about a dream I had. Yes. I mean, as in something I wanted to achieve, not mm -hmm. not a R M E R yes. <laughs> R E M dream. Yes. Um, and I was thinking, my gosh, I have been telling stories since I can remember mm -hmm. when I was a Girl Scout at the age of eight and in camp. They called me really. That was my nickname because I would cr create these. I would spin these stories, and they'd go really. And eventually, the name stuck. I bet you've never heard that one no, before. No, that's a new one. Okay. So. Um, yeah. Yeah, so I've been making up stories since ever I can remember and probably wrote my first book in fifth grade, something like that. Anyway. I told you, multi-passionate, yeah. multi-passionate. But seriously, the dream that has been fulfilled um, just two weeks ago, mm -hmm. July 12th, which was my 73rd birthday, mm -hmm. is getting this book published 
Um, and that has been the culmination, I think, of a good 40 years of my work. Yeah. Because for 40 years, I have tried to bring Christ into the lives of my patients, and I've tried to respond to their soul pain, mm -hmm. and the Lord has taught me an awful lot. So even though I didn't know that I would write the book, I think I've been primed for mm -hmm. writing the book for a good 40 years. Yeah. What did that process look like? Cause, I mean, it's been great to watch her journey, and you've gone through it. It hasn't been a straight shot right to this finale book. Right. So what has that journey looked like for you? Could you explain maybe a high low, a high point or a low point? Um, well, the low point was a lot of opposition mm. because I think, I don't know whether people are jealous of people who have dreams and are actively pursuing them, mm -hmm. but I found that there were relatives and friends that didn't understand my pursuit yeah. And we're almost um, kind of like, why are you staying home writing when you could come out and play with us? Or mm. why are you writing when you should be doing chores? <laughs> you know, I had the same mindset. I don't want to clean a house <laughs> every day of my life. Um, so the, the low point would be the chronic constant opposition mm. and needing to fight through it, needing to break through that resistance. And not but, just from the enemy, you're saying. Like it's from no, people. It's like a Nehemiah thing. Yeah. 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 Real human beings. Um, and the high points is when there were blips along the way of um, somebody really affirming what I was mm -hmm. doing. So this book actually came into affirmation stage, if mm -hmm. you will, when I was in Brazil with Randy Clark and the Global Awakening team. And we had just done some incredible ministry to people. And there was a gal by the name of Rafaela who walked for the first time in her 36 years after mm -hmm. a friend and I had spent... Um, probably a total of three days, four hours a day praying for her. And she gained mm -hmm. strength in her legs and she was able to plant her feet on the ground and um, move along. Um, she had been born, by the way, uh, with a failure of oxygen in her brain and been paralyzed since she was six months old. Wow. Or six, sorry, she was a preemie at six months old and that's when her paralysis set in. But anyway, at that point, for some reason, I got the idea that I needed to talk about the intersection of mental health and Jesus. So I ran it by Randy Clark, who has written an awful lot in the area of healing, and he thought it was a great idea. So that's when it all started. That was a moment of affirmation. Which was three, that would three have been, years ago? Four years ago? Yeah, two, two and a half years ago, Jan, okay. December of 16. Okay. So we, I was excited about it, came home, wrote my first draft, at which point um, I spoke to Randy and he said, oh yeah, I'll help you. But his staff said, uh-uh, you've got too many other things to do. So talk about resistance. That was my first hit. Yeah. And I then the biggest problem is you write a draft and then you read it and you think, oh my gosh. And then you write another draft and you read it and you go, oh my gosh. And I can remember bringing my fifth or sixth draft to Laura and Josh mm -hmm. um, last January and they they ripped it apart. I think I left there <laughs> so in, in tears. So kindly. Yeah, you, I don't know. I didn't think they were very kind. I was, really? <laughs> yeah, well, they, they bought me supper and they let me spend the night. So <laughs> you made that, fun of my shrimp too. <laughs> yeah. So if that's kindness, it is. But at any rate, the what I think one has to do if they're dreaming and they're pushing for something is they have to be aware that that dream is going to be refined, it's going to be purified, it's going to be put through a crucible. Um, and so January, they chewed it apart. I drafted it again. I drafted it again. And by March, I turned it into the hands of uh, Bonnie Lynn Smith from Ground Truth Press, who who actually crafted this finished. Um, I got to show it to you guys. I'm sorry, but it's just beautiful. Uh, Laura took that photograph and did the graphics and the inside of the book is is really beautifully packaged so a book is not just about the words but it's really the art so yeah. I just need to say that um, well, it, ha and it helps when you have a beautiful subject so oh thank you <laughs> um, and I guess I need to put that back up there um, so the, the, your question was what are the ups and downs that's pretty much it but I need to say even in this week of it being published um, it, it caused me a lot of stress because it's really quite incredible. You get a book published and then Laura, my publicist, is saying, well, you got to do this. You got to do that. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. And then I got hit with um, bouts of vertigo. So if you see me kind of going, ah, like this, that's why. Um, life is not just always an even keel and it's not just always a mountaintop. Yeah. So um, that's probably what I'll tell you guys. If you're dreaming, you got to expect the valleys. Yeah. Well, I, I think... Um there are many women that I talk to, gosh, I, there are countless women who feel led to publish a book or write, you know, something in those 
lanes where they know that they have to capture their story. Often it's their testimony or a specific message that's on their heart. And they'll ask me, what are the first steps? What do I do? What does it look like? And is there advice that you could give after doing this three times? And they're not just, I mean, they're, they're significant books. These are significant projects that you've written. And could you share some wisdom about that? Well, I will. I'll talk about my very first big project. Um, and there are a few books that she doesn't even know about that haven't been published that are on the, on the shelves. So, we need to but, work on those then. But... Um, in, I finished my doctorate in 1994, and one of the good things about uh, working on a doctorate is if you like to write and you like to analyze, a doctorate is a really good place to go. Mm -hmm. So I finished getting all of my analysis and writing out, and, and four or five years went by, and I felt bereft, like I didn't know what to do with myself. Mm -hmm. And I was walking my dogs um, in a green space in Canada on Lake Ontario, and there was a sign that said, this is the um, original homestead of Madeleine de Rabon Dallon, who was born in 1646 and died in 1712. And it's, I read that, I'm sorry, her significance was that she was the first female property holder in Canada. And I was thinking, 1646, and she held property, and she's got this plaque up? This is mm -hmm. terrific. And the Lord kind of said, why don't you write about her? Find out what life was like 300 years before you were born, because that's mm -hmm. my birth year was 1946. So I dove in. Now, the first step was to create this arc, they call it, mm -hmm. in your head. So I had this arc of the time she came to Canada till she was taken captive by the Iroquois Indian, which spanned 15 years. And then I had to research it. So then I spent a good three years reading on the Iroquois Indian, the Hur Hurons, the Cure de Bois, who are the um, woodsmen that are um, buying beaver pelts, uh, Louis XIV's court, et cetera, et cetera. And then creating a um, chapter outline, if you will, mm -hmm. which, and then eventually writing my first draft on that four years later, mm -hmm. having put multiple hours mm -hmm. into it. Um, and the draft was about 170,000 words, which is excessive. Back in the 50s and 60s, people like Taylor Caldwell and James Michener wrote books that long, but we don't do that anymore. So I had to cut that down, and I ended up loping off characters and loping mm -hmm. off um, stories and adventures and whatnot. And finally got it cut down to about 115,000, eventually found a publisher who said, we'll publish it if you can get it to 110,000. Mm -hmm. Each time I'm cutting my baby's arms off, you know, mm -hmm. each chapter. Mm -hmm. Anyway, finally it got published quite hard. I wish we had it right here in our hand, but I don't have copies immediately available. Um, and it came out in February of 2011, and that is when I contacted Laura to help me push mm -hmm. that book. Um, so... The highs and lows, again, are you got to keep your butt in the chair and your fingers on the keys. Hmm. And you got to probably say to your friends, no, I can't come out tonight and play. Yeah. And you got to do it. And you got to be able to put up with the criticism of the people who say that's not particularly well expressed or you're, con hmm. you're, you're speaking confusedly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, you even had that moment. Well, well even the, the score here, because you felt like we kind of <laughs> criticized you. Um, but there was a moment when I wrote my book, and I've mentioned it in this last episode actually, with Katie Hilbert, that I wrote a book that has not been published or anything yet, and I sent it to you. Do you remember this? And and you said about 10 things that were significant things, like read sentences over again, because you repeat yourself a lot, and you went down the list, and it was a shot to the heart, but years later when I started to reread it, I noticed as more of a developed writer, she's totally right and I think that's huge because as a writer it is so close to you it's like any person who's, who's operating in their passion it's so close that it's so personal and you can't it's you get very defensive and you can't be defensive when you're operating in your dream you have to just kind of let it be with the Lord yeah. and let people speak into it yeah. and it's it's holding it loosely yeah. you know yep. and then it, it's very difficult but I love what you said you know you have to be able to be refined yep. to make it the best that it can be yep. and I'm so excited for this book because I think it's gone through the ringer yeah but it's gotten so much better each time and I think part of it too last thing is I think that it helps you find your sweet spot and your passion because you have to sort through the many layers of what you're actually thinking like how many times did we talk about what do you actually want to say what is your message let's peel back all of the layers of all the things you want to talk about to really hone into the one thing. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. 
So we're going to talk about rest and mental health, which is super important. I think many dreamers fight the urge to always be working in their passion, to always be crafting, to work the late nights and never take a break. And I think it's a tension for people who have a vision from God to continue to strive after it. And so today we really want to talk about the importance of rest and mental health as a dreamer with the Lord. And so we're going to dive into that a conversation that you definitely want to, want to tune into. But first, we're going to take a quick break. We are birthed with these dreams inside of us and God can't wait to live them out with us because you can live your whole life and just do what everyone around you is doing and miss out. Okay, like who are we going to be meeting and who am I going to be able to link arms with to then help say, what does Jesus have for you and how can I cheer you on? that I've known Dr. Julie, one of the things of many, but one of the main things that I've admired about her is her ability to um, be disciplined in her rest. And I think that she demonstrates that so well. I mean, she's a woman that is not only adventurous and goes on these amazing vacations um, in the woods, just kind of has time with Jesus, but on a daily basis, I feel like she's very aware of how to fill her tank. And so I want to give her an opportunity to talk about that because I feel like when we're talking about our God-given dreams, it's so important that we learn how to rest. It is so important that we learn when we're on E and how to rejuvenate ourselves, to find creativity, to find innovative ideas, to recharge ourselves so that we can be the best that we can be because we're not good on E. So Mm -hmm. I want to give you an opportunity to really dive into that. Well, you know, to be honest with you, I'm surprised that Laura thinks I'm really good at rest. <laughs> um, because if she could be inside my brain, she would even wonder why she said that. Um, my brain is constantly spinning. It's spinning stories. It's spinning ideas. It's spinning sermons. It's spinning ways of helping a client. It's it's interceding for people. So for me to rest, I have to stop my brain. <laughs> Um, and honestly, about two or three years ago, um, I was told that I really need to be able to take every thought captive to mm-hmm. the Lord. And I said, what in heck does that look like? And this is what I came up with. I don't remember who shared this with me, but this is what I did to get to where I'm at. I took my phone and I set it for two minutes. <laughs> And I said, every thought that pops into my head, I'm going to dismiss it. If it's something God wants me to hang on to, I'm going to jot it down. So I literally had a little pad and paper there. If it's a to-do, I'm going to just put it off and know it's on the list. And if it's distracting, it's blown out of the water. And if I can do that for two minutes, then maybe I can do it for three. Mm. So every day, I try to incrementally increase that. Mm. So I am now, not always, but pretty well, able to... Sit, sit still, lie still, um, contemplate, meditate, and hold my thoughts for 20 minutes. And, and I'm still aware of that time frame. And during that time, I'm saying to God, what do you want to tell me? What is this all about? Why does such and such happen? And in that process, I need to have two things happen. I need to have peace hmm. settle on me, a, a spiritual peace. And I need to hear ideas but they've got to be scripturally based so it's not julie speaking or not even advice from laura it's god saying remember i told you to just take one day at a time um so that's one of the things i learned and the concept of taking one day at a time and even today we had to take almost one hour at a time at the rate we were going that's really important um jesus said that by the way the worries of tomorrow are you know sufficient i mean take today that's all you need to worry about uh, the world does not want us to operate like that. It wants us to think about what do we have to do next week and next week and next week and next week. Mm-hmm. But if, and I'm not saying be ignorant about that, be wise about the future things we have to get to, 
but put your energy into what does God package for you in this next hour, this next person you're encountering, this next cashier you're encountering, the next walk nature you're encountering. Just be mindful of what you're at, what you've got right there. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's what, <clears throat> when I think of a lifestyle of rest, uh, that's why I admire you, honestly, because I feel that you're always so present. And I, I find that even throughout our conversations or, you know, she's making dinner or we're just chatting. She's very intentional about like being in the moment. And sometimes you'll even do this thing of like, you'll, you'll kind of like, you know that you do that. You're like, you do this thing. And it's almost like you catch yourself to be in the moment. Hmm. And I think even that is a powerful way to rest because like you said, we are always spiraling in a million directions. And I feel like that's where we get exhausted. That's mm -hmm. where our bandwidth gets pulled. And mm -hmm. that's when you start feeling yourself peter out you mm -hmm. know and, and not give as much because you're just mentally all over the place and mm. i think you you demonstrate that very very well well thank you can i tell the story about my horse because it yes. fits right into this so yes. so this is a, a partially a response to laura's question about rest and also when she said to me well what story do you want to tell or what dream did god give you mm -hmm. i said can i tell a story about my horse and i should have brought a picture in for my horse but um, when I was a dairy farmer's wife back between my age of 30 and 60, on Sunday afternoons when my kids were babes and then they were growing up and going into high school and my husband was watching football, I would take my Palomino mare and go riding. And I learned to ride by watching The Lone Ranger on television, which is a sit forward position and dun 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 dun, dun all right? Mm -hmm. Well, what happened was the horse had to die when she was 30 and I then went off to try a new horse mm -hmm. And that horse threw me, not because the horse was bad, but because I was in the wrong physical posture and the horse tripped in a hole. Mm. But I got amnesia, a concussion, broken ribs, broken wrist. Make long story short, the wrist was finally healed and also divinely healed 10 years later. So it was stitched up by an orthopedic surgeon, not well. And then God healed it and straightened it right out. See, see. But I still was really anxious when it mm -hmm. came to riding horses and I wanted to overcome that. So mm -hmm. I started taking riding lessons in January of 17. And riding, taking riding lessons involved my going to a stable where there were boarded horses. So there were 10 owners that had a horse and these mm -hmm. horses had stalls. And there was a terrific young lady who was my coach. So after a year of my getting over my anxiety, mm -hmm. I said to my coach, Sharon, do you think that I could ever get a horse and do you have room? Because I obviously would need a place to keep it mm -hmm. and I needed oversight. I wasn't smart enough to handle a horse on my own. Mm -hmm. And Sharon said, no, I'm really sorry. One, we don't have room. And two, I have no idea where you're gonna get a horse that it's at your kindergarten level. <laughs> so in um, that was in January of 18. In February of 18, I'm in my moment of quiet time, my moment of rest, and I hear the Lord say, by your birthday in July of 18, I'm gonna give you a Palomino. And that was the horse I had um, when I was a young lady. And I it was blown out of the water because I couldn't figure out, I hadn't been shopping, I had no idea how to get it at any rate. But I kept my ear open and March went by. I tapped every now and then with Sharon, you know, any horses? No. Went all the way to June and on what would have been my 50th wedding anniversary, Sharon said, my friend Nancy is selling her 17 year old Palomino mare and my husband and I like you and the mayor well enough that we'll put you here as pasture boarders, which means you don't get a roof over your head, um, if you'd like to do that. And my that was that was my dream. Yeah. So by June thirtieth, um, and then my birthday was July twelfth. Um, I had Diamond come into my life. Mm -hmm. Now, this is really significant because what I've learned more than anything from having a horse is that I am connected to her the same way God is connected to me. Mm -hmm. And in the beginning, she and I didn't speak the same language. So I'd be walking her along and she was supposed to stop when I told her to. And I would say, halt. And she'd keep on walking. And that's not good horse behavior. <laughs> After a few days, somebody said to me, maybe you should try a different word. <laughs> so I tried the word, ho. Now, personally, I don't like that word, <laughs> but I tried it and the horse understood it and the horse stopped. <laughs> so. What I have learned is um, I have to really be hearing God's language to be obedient to him the same way my horse has to understand my language. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. The other thing is when you're riding a horse, you have to be very mindful of your posture 
and your habits. The reason I had gotten thrown off is because back in 2005 is because I had all the wrong habits. Yeah. My body posture was not right for balancing on a horse and staying yeah. on a horse. So I have learned proper horse behavior. I am transferring that to my horse. And I can even take this story so far as to say this. Mm -hmm. um, part of Diamond's personality has been to get a little skittish and kind of frantic when mm -hmm. things stimulate her, like um, this, the cracking of this bottle. She would actually go, oh! mm, Just like our dogs did. Yeah, just like our dogs did. Um, but I went to a spiritual conference in May of this year, and one of the things the Holy Spirit did to me is call me into a position of taking risks. Mm. The words were, Julie, I want you to unplug your surge protector and be mm. willing to take risks for me. Mm. I came back to the ranch on the next day, literally, and Diamond and I entered an obstacle course um, class. Mm. So there were 10 horses, and there were obstacles like stand, uh, walking on top of bubble wrap, going through noodles that were whipping in the air, walking mm. through a kiddie pool, stepping mm. through tires. And previously, I would have said she was going to you know block every single one mm. but she handled them all beautifully mm. and i know i really believe that as the holy spirit worked in me mm. to be willing to take risks and undo mm. my surge protector that conveyed to her mm. that she didn't have to be so skittish anymore mm. so my dream of having a horse that understands me and i understand her is in the process of being fulfilled not completely um but but that is an example of rest for me. When I'm with her, it is she and I, her body, my body, aligning perfectly, honestly getting God in the loop. So it's kind of like God, Julie, and Diamond. Um, and that's been one of the biggest life lessons I've learned. As you were talking about how you convey your fears to your horse, I feel like there are a lot of women out there in particular who have taken the fears of their parents or of their friends or their mentors, and they've started to operate out of that fear, or they've tried to operate out of that struggle or that challenge. And I think even in this season, and one thing that we wanna equip you and empower you and even challenge you with, is to align back to God as your father, because he has no fear. There are no, There's no challenge that's too big for him. There's no struggle he can't overcome. And it's really about what Julie said, where it's about unplugging from the fears in our lives, the limiting beliefs in our lives, to walk in the fullness of what he has. Yep, right. It just even yesterday, I was riding Diamond on a trail, and we were getting hit by deer flies, and Sharon was leading on her horse, and she had a... Um, it's like a horsetail connected to a crop. So it's called a fly swatter. So she was able to go like this to get the flies to leave. Yeah. Um, and I thought, well, I'll try that with Diamond. And so I asked her for it. And as, as I bring it towards Diamond, I'm introducing it to her, kind of like, Diamond, mm -hmm. be aware of this. And Sharon says, no, you're assuming she's going to be afraid of it. Mm. You need to just introduce it like she has no fear. There's nothing to fear. There's no challenge here. Yeah. She said, often in life, we end up assuming that yeah. the guy is going to expect this from us. And we end up acting in a manner that's false and not helpful. Yeah. So that's just another sidebar. We that's, could, I could do hours on this, by the way. That's so good. I mean, it's so true. How many times do we just operate out of the fear? Yeah. Just by impulse. Yeah. Okay. Lessons from diamonds. Yeah. Okay. So can you talk more about um, how you have found rest in your everyday life, especially as a, a mental health practitioner, someone who counsels people on a regular basis? How have you seen that played out? Well, on a practical basis, I make sure I got exercise and sleep. You know, there's some people who go to bed really late and don't get too much She's sleep. not looking at me. <laughs> Um, I honestly, guys, I take what I now call not a nap, but a hyphen. It's the gap oh. between morning and afternoon. Some people call it a nap. But, I um, like that hyphen. It's a hyphen. Um, and one of the reasons I call it a hyphen is because usually it's only 20 minutes long. I literally set my alarm. Um, and I don't actually fall asleep most of the time unless I'm ill or something. But what my brain does, it goes into a free fall. You know what I mean? I literally lie down with no expectations. I'm not writing anything. I'm not doing my to-do list. Mm -hmm. And I let it just, woo, 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 woo. And I wake up. If I, actually, that's the wrong word. I get up with my brain refreshed. Mm -hmm. And I've actually learned that it's good for our eyes to do that mm -hmm. because our eyes are under so much strain, particularly if you're using a computer. 
um, and it's certainly good for our body posture. I actually lie on a um, noodle so that my spine is realigned because it, as you see me sitting here like this, mm. I do this all day long and it's not healthy. Mm -hmm. So I need to put my um, back on a noodle. Anyway, so get good rest. Um, I think take hyphens all the time you can. Mm -hmm. And I actually do read stories. I love to read, particularly um, fiction, not junk fiction, but fiction that has um, psychological complexity and mm -hmm. redemptive qualities to mm -hmm. it. Um, and that just refreshes my brain. So I'd say that's something that's been always important to me. And how have you seen that play out in your practice? I mean, for people who are coming to you to, because they have a problem, they're either dealing with something relationally, um, seeing some setbacks in their lives, depression, anger, how do you see rest being a part of their healing process? Well, I guess I see actually the flip side more. Mm. I see that when they come to me with depression and anxiety, they're incapable of resting. Mm. Um, uh, or they're oversleeping, which is not really good rest. Right. There's That's not, not a balance. Yeah. It's not balanced. Right. So I, I would say that one of my goals in talking with them is to get them to a place where they can meditate. Meditate being filling the mind with the positive things that God wants us to fill it with. Yes. Not emptying our mind um, like Eastern meditation. I'm not right. saying that. Right. So it's filling our mind with positives. It's... Um, recognizing that every single choice you make adds to the sense of rest so you need to make a positive affirmative choice like i'm going to like this person i'm going to proactively forgive this person i'm going to not speak offensively about this person mm -hmm. as opposed to ah oh, this guy really ticked me off you know yeah. doing that kind shutting of shutting it down yeah like you said in your exercise to take every thought captive yes i've been reading some of the works of c.s lewis Yes. And um, actually a really delightful historical fiction called Becoming Mrs. Lewis by mm -hmm. uh, Patty Callahan, who's mm -hmm. a friend of my sister's. Anyway, um, C.S. Lewis really believed the our creator God was the great storyteller. Mm -hmm. And when that creator has the kingdom of God, which is full of life and love and peace, and has a redemptive ending to people who are weeping and crying and in pain, he is telling the ultimate story. Mm -hmm. And in the Chronicles of Narnia and some of his other work, he s says that the human heart is drawn to that story. And he almost says that that is the um, proof that God exists. Mm. And one of the amazing things I find in talking to people is that they have not learned that they have a spiritual side to them. Mm. Um, a, a lot of folks I'll say when I meet them for the first time, well, what are your spiritual resources? And they go, what are you talking about? What are mm. spiritual resources? And if they're completely unchurched people, I have to say, well, it could be that you enjoy watching a waterfall or listening mm. to a violin concert. And then they start tuning into it a little bit. But I think what we human beings are lacking is a sensitivity in our spiritual selves to the spiritual story, the redemptive mm. story of heaven and paradise with God. We, we're just missing that. And mm. I think we need to move um, our clients in that direction. We may need to move our heart into that direction. So how do you move in that direction? Well, I watch that happening in um, the situation we're in. Um, for example, when you arrived, when you called me this morning, she'd gotten lost or discombobulated on the throughway. Mm -hmm. um, honestly, I could have reacted, oh, mm -hmm. crumb, that's terrible, mm -hmm. that's so stupid, let's cancel, right? Mm -hmm. But I think I went to it with, oh, okay, well, God knows what we need, and mm -hmm. that's probably fine. You probably mm -hmm. need that time extra, and I probably need that time extra. I don't know. But the point being is I looked for the redemptive solution. I looked for the positive mm -hmm. option, the reframe mm -hmm. of the problem. And I think I've tried very hard to get into that habit. Mm -hmm. When I'm working with clients, I try to reframe the dilemmas that they're facing. So they become positive challenges as opposed to drags and, and disasters. Does that make mm -hmm. sense? Mm -hmm. So that's I good. I hope that answers your question. Yeah. I mean, well, I think we've kind of noticed the theme is a couple of our guests have talked about, talked about that same idea of reframing the negative things into positive. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes we disregard that important discipline because we think that it's just the power of positive thinking. Mm -hmm. But it really is, like you said, finding the redemptive quality in it and looking to 
through the cross um, into our situations Mm -hmm. and finding the nugget, if you will, of what he's trying to say Mm -hmm. through us. We have to remember when we look at something like the crucifixion Mm -hmm. that there is a resurrection. Yeah. So if there's a weakness in my part, Mm -hmm. uh, in in my body or in my soul, I know and I can believe that my maker has made some redemptive solution to that. Dr. Julie is 73 years old. She has gotten a horse in the past year. She's published a book in the past year. She goes on vacation every year. She's gone to Brazil and Israel and all these places all over the world. <laughs> and and I think that is a testament that um, you need to keep dreaming. Um, there's never a time that you're too far gone, that it's too late, whatever, um, to not only go after your dream, but to go on new adventures, to spur your soul in new ways. And that's what it's about. That's what I see in her life is you need to just continue to pursue creativity and knowing your soul and what fills it. Do you love photography? Do you love to draw? Do you love to read or take hyphens? Um, do what fills you up. Um, but you have to make the time for that. You have to be the one that proactively goes after that because no one else is going to make a space for you to rest. Right. The world will continue to tell you, work harder, I want more of your time, I want more of this, more of your resources, more of your bandwidth. You are the only one that can say, enough is enough, I am resting. Right. You need to say that. And I think you use the word creativity. I wanna highlight that because we were mm-hmm. created in the image of the creator. Mm-hmm which means that it's in his design for us to be yeah. creative. Mm-hmm. And if we fail in being creative, we are not fulfilling his destiny for mm-hmm. us. And he rejoices and just gets ex- giggly excited, you know, yeah. sings, what is that? Sings over us with yeah. um, Thanksgiving or yeah. something in Zephaniah. Anyway, so we've got to remember that we are created in the image of God who mm-hmm. is creative mm-hmm. and let, let him pour it into us. Yeah, one last story, but it made me think of that because there was a season of my life, I, I've talked about it before, I believe, um, when I first moved to Cleveland that I went through a major depression. And Julie was one of those people amongst a few other women who were there with me in it um, as far as like emotionally being there for me and in support. And the one thing that she, amongst other women, were saying was you need to find an outlet to just charge yourself. You need to do something creative. So they were telling me to do paintings. I'm not a painter. I can do design all day long, but to actually paint, I'm way too recovering of a perfectionist for that. I can't, I can't do it. Um, so she was, they were telling me, just do something out of the box, like do something fun. And so I picked up a spin class, which I'm not really a group exercise person. I love to just kind of do my own thing. But I did this spin class and it got me out of depression. Like that was one of the things Um, obviously partnering with God, I would listen to worship music and I would pray and I would just have that moment with the Lord, but it was my outlet to rest and get my mind focused in a new, in a new direction where I was actually charging my own soul with every single pedal. Right. And it was like, every time I would pedal and if you'd go up that hill, right, where they had the opposition, if you've ever done a spin class, you have to charge yourself to keep going. You have to have that self-motivation to like kick yourself in the butt and I think that rest is, a, it's a perfect picture of rest where it's like, you know what you need and you need that time to charge yourself to keep going forward. And part of that is taking the hyphen. Right. Interesting. It's interesting that Laura is talking about resting by pedaling in a spin <laughs> class. And I'm talking about resting by trotting on a horse. So what yeah. is this picture here? Rest. We are redefining rest. Rest yeah. is not what our body is doing so much as what our soul is doing in the midst of that activity really yeah that's true and i think that's this is really good yeah because i think that some people have the misconception that rest means i'm going to go turn off everything everyone has to be quiet all the kids silence put to bed i'm going to go sit in silence and solitude for an hour and a half Mm -hmm. and i think rest is really the definition of recharging yourself and that comes in many forms and fashions for us that's good okay so we encourage you guys to take a hyphen, um, <laughs> find something out of the box to do. And if you need more on that, go find Katie Hilbert's episode because she talks all about that and going out of the box to hear God's voice. And um, and we encourage you to just do something creative, something that would fill you up that maybe you're feeling a little bit depleted on. And the last section that we have is the copper fish bowl, where our guests get to pick a couple spitfire questions and 
answer on a whim. So we're going to let her. On a whim, wow. On a whim. So you get to pick one. She put bubble gum in here. I can't get my <laughs> no, hands it's... out. I was like, is there really? No. <laughs> I was going to say, it's been that kind of week, man. I probably would. What would take you to the next level of success? Level of success. Um, it would be um, the next level of, gosh, can I just say I want to die? <laughs> I'm not kidding you. I want to get into heaven. I mean, I'm not suicidal, and I don't mind sticking around for as long as the Lord wants me to. And Laura wants me to. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, but honestly, um, I don't know. That's probably not the kind of answer you want. But can I let that that's one go? That's a perfect Jules answer, honestly. <laughs> okay. I'll try another one, guys. Cause I can because help. if anything, she loves Jesus so much. Oh, my goodness. She takes communion every single morning. <laughs> It's amazing. Yeah, that actually, that's a practical solution for the issue of rest. Because if yeah. I if I wake up and there is a burden on my life, whether it's a mm -hmm. physical ailment, whether it's a person who's in a mess, mm -hmm. whether it's somebody who needs inter you know intercession, knowing that I've brought it in under the blood of Christ through taking communion is mm -hmm. really powerful. So I yeah. I've been doing that for two and a half years. And I think it's terrific. Yep. Okay. How has your vision differed from God's plan? When did you decide to get out of the way? When did I decide to get out of the way? That is a daily experience. Mm. Um, dying to self, saying my body is not really what's important. I mean, not that I don't mm. want to take care of it, but for example, with the vertigo I mentioned, mm. I've got to just push through it. You know mm. what I mean? I can't just completely collapse. Mm -hmm. um, and when did my vision differ from God's plan? To be honest with you guys, I met Jesus and fell in love with him on April 17th, 1964, when I learned why he died, which was for me and my sins and my messy life. And I don't, I may have argued with God off and on since then, but I don't think my plan, my overall plan has differed since then. That's almost it for this episode, but we end every single uh, show with the question with the fill in the blank, what happens when you let God? So how would you answer that? When What happens when I let God? Exciting new discoveries, revelations, um, watching him teach me new things through horses mm -hmm. and friends and dogs and books. Um, every day is what happens when I let God. That's probably yeah. one of the reasons I like to wake up in the morning. You just like to let him live every day with you. Yeah. What do you want to tell me today? That's so good. Wisdom from Dr. Julie Caton. She's <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks so much for joining me. This is awesome. You're welcome. And we want to encourage you guys, if this conversation blessed you, if you're thinking about rest and you're now thinking, oh my gosh, I don't know how to find that. I don't know how to find my core values that would lean into rest. I don't know how to actually hear God's voice and press into what I love. We really encourage you to come to the written retreat and you can now sign up. Registration is open. We have less than 30 spots available. So you want to make sure you get in there and it's really going to be a weekend Thursday through Sunday where you can encounter God and take a deep breath and maybe overcome some disappointments, press into him about the vision that he has for your life. And maybe you don't have a dream. Maybe it's something that you've been wanting a vision and a purpose for your life and you haven't been able to find it. This is the perfect opportunity to hear from God about what he has to say about your purpose for life. So we hope that you join us. You can catch the link right here and we'll tell you how to get all the information about the retreat and to register. And that's it for this yeah. episode. And if you want a dream, ask God for one, by the way. He'd love, he's a dreamer. He'd yeah. love to give you a dream. Yes. And also, we want to encourage you guys, final note, make sure you grab Dr. Julie's new book, Soul Pain Revealed. It is now available on Amazon, so you can go search it, Dr. Julie Caton, Soul Pain Revealed. Make sure you grab a copy. It's going to change your entire life and perspective of how faith bridges with mental health all the way through suffering. And make sure you leave a review for her, too. So thanks so much for joining us. We can't wait for next time and we'll see you later. Bye. Bye.